everyone to welcome to the uh, Chapter of Champions, which is sponsored by the Sherman's Bookstore. I know some of you are here for the long weekend. It's paying on, and I hope you have a chance to really appreciate this wonderful library and the bookstore and all the shops along the Main Street. Please, please help yourself to everything that's wonderful. Um, our next Chats with Champions will be here at Porter Hall on June 6th. 10 a.m. and uh, the mystery writer Bruce Coffin will be the speaker. Before we begin, I'd like to request that all cell phones and electric devices be turned off now. Our speaker for today is Hank Lund, who lives with his family in Camden, Maine. He has spoken in many venues around the strait, and we are delighted to have him here with us today. He will be telling us his very personal family story about the prisoner of war camp in Bolton, Maine. <clears throat> after the, at the end of World War II, and its ultimate relationship to him and his family. Please give a warm welcome to Hank Long. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, can you hear me back there? Yes. 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 Okay. We used to say, if you can't, if you can hear me, if you can't hear me, raise your hand. <laughs> okay. Uh, as Margaret has said, this is a personal story. It's through the eyes of a 13-year-old boy. And um, so it, it's very personal, and it may be sometimes maybe contradictory or whatever or to some of the experiences that some of you have had. I look around the room every time I do this program. I look to see if there are other people in there who have the same color hair as I have. <laughs> and if they do, then some of them may have had an experience which was totally negative as to what my experience was. So that's sort of a precursor to this situation. I'm going to start with the program uh, a, a little bit of information before this. I am a Rooster County boy. I grew up there on the farm, this farm here, that my grandfather established in 1893. Uh, his Scotch and uh, Irish ancestry. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I was living on a farm. There were uh, my mother, father, my bachelor uncle, my mom's brother, my two brothers, and my younger sister. And then sometimes there would be other people who came in and out of the, of the family. So you can imagine how many people there were in our family at one time. So I grew up with that kind of an environment uh, out in the country. Eight miles from Holton, six miles from Monticello. And those of you who have ever been or had our first start, from Rooster County. Anybody from Rooster County? Yay. All right. Okay. <laughs> Ta Towns. East Hodgson. Okay. Just was there last week. Prescott. Isle. Prescott. Isle. P.R. Okay. My buddy Bob Palm from Prescott. Isle. Bob Savage. Palm. P-A-M. P-A-R-M. This. Uh, how about the Savages? Uh, Savage Mike or, uh, there you go. Savage, yeah. Right. Anyone else? Have to check it out. And these folks here. Monticello. Monticello, that's where my mom was from. The other thing, the other thing I found out, you know, I find out a lot of stuff. These folks, he's a Methodist minister, and I was a Methodist. Or at least my mother thought I was a Methodist. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we'll start back a little further. We'll not start with right there at that particular time in history, 1945. I want to start back a little further because it's important, I think, to set the stage. As kids, we knew that there was a war on early on. We knew that there were things going on in, in Europe and so forth. We knew that. My father was a, a radio buff, and he had built a antenna system for our radio, one of those old silver tones that would bring in shortwave or uh, foreign bands. So he knew history and he knew what was going on in Europe probably better than anybody around. So uh, so in, 40, in the 40s we knew that things were happening in Europe. But as little boys, 10 year olds running around in 1941, uh, we played the game of war. Now, I imagine every boy in this room played war. And so, you'd pick up a stick and you'd say, bang, bang, you're dead. You'd fall down, you'd get up again, and you'd play some more. That's your concept. That was our concept of war. And then, one day, in 1941, 
this happened. It was a Sunday, and because my dad had that shortwave radio, he could tell what was going on, and we got news. And it was a Sunday afternoon, and we had dinner, and my mom was out there cleaning up in the kitchen, either cleaning it up or making, getting ready for supper. And Dad was listening to the radio, my two older brothers and I were running around, my sister was there, and we were probably bothering her. And, but anyway, there was a pretty good uproar in the house at that time in the afternoon. And all of a sudden, my father says, quiet, you know, really loud. My dad was a quiet man. And we froze in our track. We said, oh my Lord, what's going on? And he says, those dirty mm, 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 Japs have bombed Pearl Harbor. First thing we said, who are the Japs? And where's Pearl Harbor? Because we had no idea. Well, my brothers certainly filled me in, and my dad filled me in, and pretty soon I understood that we now were no longer playing in war. We were at war. And all of the things that I had played with and thought about had changed. We had already had people from our community go away and go to the war. You'd look around the community, you would see either a blue star or a gold star in windows. And you found out that people were either being killed or being sent away for the army and so forth, or the service. So it becomes more and more real. And that's when things really started to change. Because up until this time, yes, we were, there were, uh, we had to go out and, and before this, we were getting junk tires and aluminum, and we were selling them to Japan. Batteries, so forth. But all of a sudden, that changed, and we started collecting that stuff for our war So what did we do as kids? You got your allowance, so you uh, would take your allowance and the idea was, let's save, let's get some war bonds here. So you would save your money, 10 cents, 20 cents, so forth, and then you'd put them in a book, and when you got done, you got yourself a war bond, a $25 war bond, which was impressive. And here's the kind of propaganda that we were getting to help us do it. Even a little bit helped. Okay. So that was what we were, that's what was happening with us as children. This is a child effort to get us involved in the war effort. Then the next thing that happened was that uh, we had decided that uh, we, we needed to do whatever we could for that. And then, so we started doing other things. As a kid in grammar school, I would walk by the town office every day in Littleton, and up on top of the little up there in Littleton was a cupola, and it was where uh, we were the plane spotters became. And I became a plane. My buddy Mac and I would, on our way home from school, we would do our shift as airplane spotters. Now, geography: Holton, Maine, was eight miles away from us. Holton was an Army Air Force base that had P-38s on it. And P-38s were running, uh, flying up to Presque Isle and doing the cover for bombers that were headed for Europe. So we saw P-38s all day long. And we knew those guys. They were our heroes and we, were, we knew how to spot them. But thank God we never saw any of these guys. We saw a lot of these. We never saw any German Stukas, we never saw any German fighters, but we saw B twenty B seventeens and so forth, B twenty four, B sixes. We saw those and we can identify them. So now we are now getting more and more involved in the war effort. The other thing that was happening, and I don't have any pictures of this, but I, I, I should, but maybe some of you remember the propaganda that we have, and every place, every war, everything, there's always propaganda. So our concept of what a Japanese person was, not a Japanese, we call it Japs, and I'm sure some people remember that. Our concept of a Jap at that time was a soldier with buck teeth, with a helmet on, looked like a, you know, a fun thing, and a bayonet, and, excuse me, but with a baby on the end of it. That's what we saw. 
The other thing we saw was the Germans jackbooted Crouch with bayonets on the end and babies on them. That's what we saw as children growing up as far as the propaganda was concerned and our feelings toward our enemy. These people were indeed our enemies. So that's what I was doing at that time, <coughs> going to grammar school and seeing this kind of thing. Scrapped the aluminum off of gum, bubble gum, any kind of gum. You would peel that off, kept it in a bundle. The other thing we would do would we would also you had there was paper that they wanted, there was rubber. Oh man, if you could ever find a rubber tire along the road, that would be great. You can take it down to the local place and get it five or whatever, some cents. And then you could go to the local, you know, store and get yourself a soda pop. And then of course rags. We didn't understand what that was. Those are the things we used to throw out, you know. So all of this stuff becomes very, very important stuff as far as the war effort is concerned. The other thing that happened was, see, we didn't want to get into this war until the Japanese struck us. People like, uh, you know, uh, FDR, our president, he was being pressured to stay out of the war. Uh, but he says, I've got the help. And he finally convinced the Europe and, and the Congress and so forth to help. And we had a thing called Lend-Lease. We were giving them all of our old ships, we were giving them airplanes, and we were giving them food. We were starting to build airplanes at that time for the war effort. Now this, the Holton Airport, the Army Air Base, is only a mile from the Canadian border. You can see it, I can see it from my house, my old house. And so what they would do, the Americans would send over airplanes that fly them into Holton, and then they would hire a farmer, maybe one of my neighbors, and they would come out and they would take this airplane and they would drag it up right to the border. And then they would push it over the border into Canadian territory, and then the Royal Canadian Air Force pilot would take the plane and fly it off. Now, they didn't have an, air, a, an airstrip right across the border, but I guess we wanted the Canadian Highway was right there, and they would take off on the Canadian Highway. And so that's how they got, so this is Lindley, by the way, those airplanes were so obsolete, they were really not any worth anything. But at least we tried to do something to help out the war effort. So, so this is building up now, okay, the 41 to 45, 44, 45. So the war is raging now on two fronts. And so, VE Day, victory in Europe, May the 8th, 1945. The war in Europe is over, but the battle of the city is raging, and our men, young men, are going to war. My uncle, who was 41, is drafted. Because he was a wicked good shot during uh, training, they made him a gunner uh, trainer. So he was training fighter pilots how to shoot. The other thing was that we were shipping food to Europe at this time, to, to, particularly to England, because they had suffered so much and they were so they didn't have food and they were hungry. And they were housing German prisoners in uh, in Great Britain, England. Now English people were starving, many of them, and so now we were giving food to them and also giving it to the German prisoners. And someone had the good idea, thank the good Lord, they said, why should we be feeding them there when there is a shortage of workers in America? So they said, let's bring those prisoners of war to America. We'll still ship the food over there, food over, men back. And that's what happened. So the German prisoners were brought to America. Many people didn't know that, and this morning I had a conversation and with one person here, and they, knew, and they didn't remember that. You know? This is where the places were in America for German prisoners. Not only German prisoners, but Italian prisoners, and believe it or not, we even had some, some uh, Japanese prisoners in America. 
mostly on the West Coast, down through here. Now, if the first people they brought over, they landed them right about here. Now, if you were a, a German prisoner or a prisoner of war, and you were landed there, uh, you'd sort of think, okay, uh, if I want to run away, where am I going? And then, so there wouldn't be too much of a chance for them going. But if you look at this, here's Maine, okay? There's Maine. There is Halton, Maine, right there. That's Presque Isle there. Over here is a place called uh, Sabumic, where the wood camps were. And there was also one down east in Princeton. But this was a major place right here in 1944 in Bloomberg. And, and all of these other places were units where G German prisoners, Italian prisoners, and so forth were, were housed. In May, I just want to show you this. I can't help it. I'm a man. <laughs> uh, so then I'm hoping I grew up right there, right on that border. And there's fresh folks. Okay, limestone is where the new base is. Fresh is where the B uh, B24 blew out, or, guess, out of there. Over here in this area is where the uh, woodworking was done. We also had one down here, right next to the Canadian border, or excuse me, New Hampshire border. But they all came out of Holta, and some were down here in Eastport in this area here. So, so it, each one had a specific thing that they were doing. So here's how many people we had. 425,000 German prisoners in America. 2,000 in Holta. And eight of them were working in America. These are the guys. And I will be talking one and, and about several of them, but there were a couple of them that were really important to us. This fellow here, Willie, we had two Willies. This one here, Willie could speak a little English. This Willie did most of it by sign language. This guy here was transferred right off. And the reason was that he was a Nazi. He was still a Nazi. We had two brands of them. Some of them were, were caught in, uh, in Normandy on uh, D-Day. The others came from Africa, Africa Corps. This guy was an Africa Corps. What they did with him was they ship him out right off quick if they start trying to propagate Africa. If they try to get people to maintain or continue to talk the, the war. And they moved him right off quick. So we had these six guys, and they did replace him with somebody, and I can't remember his name at all. But these are the men who worked for us on our farm. Why did they come to America? Why did they come to our farm? In 1944, all those men that we had around town were gone, young men. We had old men who could pick potatoes, and we had our families, uh, children, me, we had to go to school in Rooster County for two weeks, so you can go pick potatoes. Mm -hmm. Now, if I say potatoes, I sometimes say potatoes. That's spelled with a B. <laughs> uh, so, so you, that's a rustic cost or tater talk or whatever. So, you go out and you pick potatoes. Potatoes. So, uh, so we had to find out. Yes, ma'am. You said eight, eight working on the farm, but you have seven names there. That's right. And some of them were moved. I'm, I, and I apologize to you because I haven't updated my information. I need to do that and look back on my research and see if I can find who those guys were. I don't have that right now. Thank you. You must be a math teacher. <laughs> <laughs> and if you were down front, you get an A. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a lot of time. Okay. These are the men. These were men who were caught in France. And uh, if you look at their faces, remember my brothers at this particular time were 18 years old. One had been sent, uh, not sent, well, after he graduated from high school, he went in, was uh, not drafted, yeah, he was drafted, into the Army Specialized Training Corps and sent down to the University of Maine to become a code breaker or a spoon or something. My other brother, because he was the oldest boy in the family on the farm, was not draftable. 
So he stayed home, and he hasn't forgiven the draft board since. He wanted to be a fighter, too. So here are the guys. If you look at these faces. Babies. Many of them were the same age as my brothers. Some of them had been in the Army since 14, 15, 16. Some of these men were only 18 years old. So that just was the beginning of how we interacted and saw these men. They were young men, just like my brothers. But we needed about 126,000 workers to pick the potatoes in the fall. We didn't have them. We used to inherit, uh, import uh, uh, Native Americans from down, down east, and they would come and pick. Or we would have Jamaicans or Bahamians, but they were, didn't like it, but it was too cold. They didn't like to pick potatoes. So here we have these guys. And by the way, these men did not, they were not forced to work. They could work if they wanted to, was strictly volunteer. No one forced them. So here are the boys from France. Here are some of the men from Africa. Now, as we go along, you can see, they kept their hats and they tried to keep their uniforms. They tried to keep their uniforms when they were here. But what happened was, most of the time they were changed over to Americans and a big POW on the back. So we had two brands of guys. We didn't have any Italians, uh, so we had these guys, and they were, they were there at home. So my father, in 1945, we got through the first year, 44, and, but then in 45, we needed more work, more helpers. So dad said, okay, what's it going to cost me to get these guys? Well, I think it's about 50 cents a day that we had to pay the government for these men. One man, 50 cents. So we, and you, the number of men who worked on your farm was relegated by how big your farm was. So we didn't, we had a small farm, so this is what we, we had eight people. <laughs> Here's another shot of them out in the field working. You notice now they look a little different, but you see, Here's one, whoop, excuse me. There's one with the African poor hat on. Uh, and then, but most of the time they were in American clothing. When they weren't picking potatoes, of course you don't pick potatoes in the wintertime. Uh, so what did they do with these men? They cut wood. So they would go to places like Sabumic and other places and they would cut wood. And those of you who would ever cut wood, you probably recognize that tool right there. That's called a cross-cut saw. And it's a team effort. One guy pulls, and the other guy pulls. You don't push a cross-cut saw. You'll notice that there were no power tools here. Axes, PVs, and what have you. That's, so they went out the North Woods. They lived in, in what we used to call rubber camps. And uh, they had the, their food, etc., up there as well. Here's a picture of them at Spencer Lake, which is one of those I showed you when I went to the western part of Maine. Now, these men had to get up in the morning around 4.30 or so forth, get themselves fed biscuits, beans, molasses, coffee. That's what they had for breakfast. In their lunch buckets, they would put in biscuits, beans, and then someone maybe would have coffee. At supper, biscuits, beans, and coffee. And pie, by the way. The other thing that happened is that they had to walk to their work site. They had to get there. They took their lunches in a bucket. When they, at noontime, it would be frozen. Therefore, they'd have to build a fire and then have to thaw it out so that they could eat it. This is Sabumik. If those of you who are fisher persons, you may have gone to Sabumik. This was a woods camp. But now it was turned over into uh, for the German Africa Corps. And here's the staff building and so forth, different places. This dormitory was turned over. There was a jail here somewhere, sentry post and so forth. That's all. So that was up on the, up on the, the shore of Lake Sabumik. Uh, so, so you had two places, Holton major place, and then you had, uh, they could go out and work in these other places, but they, men all lived first, 
the gold. But then they could go to work in these other places. What did they do? Okay, these, every place that they went, they marched. And oftentimes they sang. And so this is where they're, you know, the men are going around. Do you notice there may be a few guards around? Yes, there were guard posts. Yes, there were places with machine guns and guns and so forth. But you know what? Most of the time, there's no ammunition. Because they weren't going anywhere. If you know where Holton is, those of you who were in Ludlow, was it? <laughs> East Hodgson? Okay. All right. So you know, there's not too many places you can go now. <laughs> so anyway, here they were. Uh, they liked to sing. There was one American song that they loved. It went like this. Gene Autry made it famous. Well, give me land, lots of land, under stars, stars above. Don't fence me in. <laughs> the other thing that they did, and I learned this one just last week from some of the guys who were younger than me in Hope, Maine. They said these men oftentimes would march back to the base because if their bus, or not bus, if their truck was late, they'd just simply start walking, marching. And so one of the things was that these little boys, you know, eight, ten years old, would go out and the boys, would, these Germans, would be walking by. And they would, the boys would sing, up we go into the wild blue yonder, you know, and then cheer. I mean, the boys, the little kids, American kids, would cheer. And then the Germans would do this. Up we go in the wild blue, blue yonder, mm, crash! <laughs> uh, it's a different point of view. <laughs> so, they had mess hall that ran just like any other mess hall. There would usually be one American there. I think that's an American that takes some stripes on his arm there, I think. Anyway, and then here's the chow hall. Any of you men and ladies who have been in the service, you know the chow hall is always look the same. Yeah. And uh, at least they did today when I was there. Uh, interesting story. And I, I have to throw this in. You know, Yankee ingenuity is an incredible thing. And particularly, I don't know whether it's particularly about Mainers or not, but sometimes I like to think so. Uh, but this fellow here that ran the, the, the um, commissary and kept the food, they had to buy their food from someplace. And so the farmers and whatever they buy, they go into town and they would buy the fresh vegetables and so forth. And they would then use it in the mess hall. Well, this guy figured he was a local farmer, or had been. He said, I got an idea. Why don't I see if there are any farmer, any uh, young farmers here in the German POW group who would like to have a garden? And they, of course, he got a lot of volunteers. So they started a garden. It was green. So in the summertime, he had all the greens, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this worked out pretty well because he got paid by the government to raise this, not to raise, but to get by the food. Now he's raising it, so you can imagine that he had uh, something put in that pocket. Well, not only did he do that, but then he had another stroke of genius. He said, food, how about meat? Well, the, one of the most interesting and quickly growing critters around our territory was a pig. So if you had a good sow, you can, might have 12, 14 little pigs in this, whatever. No. So he built himself a pig farm. And the boys, the Germans, loved it because they could go out and work with these little critters. That was fun. So one day, he had six pigs that were just about ready to be food. So he would go out in the morning and Rodney well, count one, two, three, four, five, six. Let's go back and so One morning he comes out and he goes one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> so then he looks around. He goes out and looks at the pan to see if anybody's dug a hole or anything like that. No hole, nothing. But one less pig. That afternoon, the word comes out that two prisoners had escaped. And you know where they went? They went to Linnaeus. That's just down the road a little ways, toward the Haynesville woods. Now you have probably heard Dick Curlis sing the song about the northeast, the, the Haynesville woods. There are a hundred miles of you know bad, and there's tombstone every mile because it's a bad place. Anyway, these two German prisoners took the pig, and away they run. I don't know their name was Tom Jack. <laughs> But anyway, they went and they took the pig and they went down into the woods and they cooked it, killed it, and cooked it. Now, those of you who know anything about pork, you know you gotta cook it just so. 
They didn't know that. So two days later, these two men come crawling back into Fulton prison camp, sick as dogs. Did they punish them? No. They just figured they had had enough already. They weren't going to go anywhere, and so forth. It's interesting about the guards' relationship with the German prisoners. It was very, very congenial. Oftentimes, the guard up at the post would go to sleep, and so the German prisoners would throw rocks at them to keep them away. <laughs> now, that's, now, that's the food situation. They also had all kinds of care. Here's an American so a soldier, because he's got his tie on, and probably this is a German assistant and so forth. So they had all that care. And then also, here's a barber shop. I don't know whether it's an American or uh, who or what, but anyway, they had that kind of care, always. Uh, they had men just eating. Here's their canteen. They got so much money, not actual cash, but they got this money in script. And they were, then they could take that script and they could go to their canteen and they could buy what they wanted to, toothpaste, uh, cigarettes, uh, whatever. They could even buy beer on certain occasions. Now, you men will well probably understand this, but there's a thing called near beer. Who knows what near beer is? Well, it's about three point rather than five or six, so alcohol content. You have to drink an awful lot of it to do anything. So anyway, they, they could buy near beer. They also had music. All those instruments were, were provided by the United States government, and they just loved to play, and they would create these bands. And the inter in interesting thing was, they were asked to pay, play for the officers, but they were not asked to pay for the enlisted. That's one of those discriminations that took place in the United States Army, and maybe still does. This is a play here. There, and, whoop, uh, they are they're having a play here. That's probably they have no beer in there, but they had a lot of plays. And they and you notice too the P on his arm. So they were they they wrote plays and and executed them all the time. Okay, so that was the entertainment that they had. Okay. They had a real they took courses in college. University of Maine in Orno sent professors to Holton, Maine and supplied the books so that these men, if they wanted to, they could study education. And some of these men came back to the United States later on. We had a couple of them in our neighborhood. In fact, there's, I think there were one or two down this way who became lawyers. Up our way, there were a couple of doctors. In Camden, there was one, not in Camden, but out in Warren, Union area, there was a doctor there that had come from, from Germany, from POW people. Okay, now we're getting into here. Okay. All right, now, that is my father. That is a two row pig digger. That right there, ladies and gentlemen, is me. <laughs> I'm 13, and my father, and, and Okay, my section, the section is what you did, what you pick each day. All right. Now, my section started there at the end of the row and ran up to here. And I complained to my father, I said, why am I picking potatoes when we have German prisoners on here who are supposed to be picking our potatoes? He said, whose farm is this? <laughs> I answer, he says, if you live on this farm, you work on this farm. Yeah. I had to work just as hard as anybody else picking potatoes, and so that's the way it was. Now you'll notice that today I bought, brought my special equipment with me. This is a basket from my hometown, 1945. That basket was one we had made. Right on it, you can't probably read it, but it usually said DM1 and Sons. That was my father, that was my basket, a basket. Now there's other equipment you had to have. You had to have a hat, a baseball hat usually, and if it could be one that said John Deere on it, that was even better. <laughs> and then the other thing that you had to have were gloves. Now, 
I'm going to ask a very special question here in a minute, and, and this is part of your quiz, so pay attention. <clears throat> Who can tell me the nickname of these gloves? Yes. Monkey face. Monkey face! Yay! <laughs> you get an A. All right, now, these are monkey faces. My dad would go to Holton, and he would buy bundles of these things and give them to the Germans. Now, they were very nice. They're warm. Now, there's another part of these things that are really important in, in when you're working in uh, September or, you know, and it's cold, because you've got... You can wipe your nose with that thing <laughs> nice and soft on your nose. So, that was, that's the equipment. Now, the other thing is that uh, you'll notice that I'm standing up picking potatoes, and this is the way you pick potatoes. You know, you do this and throw it, and then you throw your basket in front of you, and you pick it more, and you throw it in front of you, and you do that. Okay, now, that's the position that you assume to pick potatoes up there on my farm, or our farm. Oh my God, am I having an answer or no? <laughs> <laughs> and I even had a fair smile on my face. Now, you take a look at these two young men. They're African core men. And you'll notice their position of picking potatoes. They're down on their knees. And you can't pick potatoes fast if you're down on your knees. So, you know, see that fellow back there, he's doing the same thing. And so, they're slow. They could pick, they were required to pick 25 barrels a day. Now, my sister, on a good day, at 10 years old, could probably pick 25 or 30, no problem at all. She said she could pick 50, but I'm not sure. <laughs> my wife says she could pick 100. By the way, she lived in limestone for a while, and Learn to pick potatoes. What was your max? Pardon? What was your max? Oh, maybe 75 at the most. I if my dad was right behind me. <laughs> How about you? 94. No! Okay. <laughs> Where did you do the picking? Oh, I'm you are? Yeah. I'm a Lowry farm. You know that my mother is a Lowry? <laughs> <laughs> was it Fred? Yeah. My Uncle Fred. My God, I can't <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and young Fred was my friend, my age. Yeah, Doug's son. Yep, yep. So we... <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can't help it, folks, but every time I do this, it is the most marvelous experience. You know, I met these Methodists here, you know. <laughs> from Presque Isle and, and, and Ludlow and wherever. I just think it's a what? Maine is a very small place. You know? But thank you so much. Wow. That's fantastic. All right. Okay, so you know what that's all about. Good thing. All right. So, here well, they are. One difference in technique of that basket is too heavy to pick up. You roll. That's right. Oh. That, yeah. And you would wear them out. Yeah. 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 This who made my knickknacks. Yeah. He would go down in the swamp, the old grandfather would go down in the swamp and get a, an ash and beat it, and then he would make these. I, I, I cherish that basket. Okay. I can't believe it. <laughs> wow. This is the our home. Uh, the barn is gone now. It went down to somebody bought it, took it to Cape Cod, and made it into a restaurant. <laughs> the, the machine shop is still there. The, the picker shack is gone, but the house is still there. My dad, grandfather, built this in 1893. He built it in three sections. He built this little section here first, then he built this on, and then he built this section here. This, by the way, picture was taken March the 21st. When I got out of the name. So the dad was out there by himself. Now, please note the wraparound porch, glass in. A couple of other things, just to point out these old things. Remember I told you about my father's his, his radio business? There's, whoop. What, what am I doing? Okay, here we go. There's the antenna. There we go up there. There's the other one there. 
Now, I swear that there was one day when Dad and I were working on the grave uh, tractor right there that a P-38 went underneath it, but I had to it All right, so there you are. Okay. It's important to put this picture in now for you to visualize and hold that in your memory as we go forward. <coughs> we had a good year in 1944. We made some money. Now, if you're a farmer in Aroostook County, or at least around my territory, if you ever made any money, you didn't go to Florida or anything like that. You might have gone up to the Miramichi and went fishing, but you usually bought new equipment. So you never had any real cash laying around. So Dad went down to Holton and went to the GM Motor guy, and some of you may remember him, Max Eskovich. So Max had a nice lot of great uh, these were made this particular uh, was made they call them b 44s because they were even in 45 they were the same model because they made they didn't change so dad went down to max and he said i'd like to buy that car max and he says don you got any money <laughs> Dad said, no, but I've got a lot of potatoes. <laughs> so he said, how many barrels is it going to take me to buy that car? So Max told him a number, and we started carrying. Because what Max would do is then put him on the commodity bread and make money. I mean, he really did quite well. So Dad bought this car. It was bright red. Oh. You know, one of the lot. And the other thing I have to, this is not the car, but I just want to point out a couple of things. It was the model, but... It did not have any hubcaps, it did not have any white walls, it did not have any chrome on it whatsoever. Everything was gray. And now, so that, but it was, and it had a radio. All right, now, Dad finished up the contract with bringing the money down and, and buying the thing. All right, now, the next thing that happened was that he goes down and up the car, raises the trunk, no spare tires. He looks in the front, He's jumped in, he's going to drive it. There was no steering wheel. He said, okay, Max, what's it going to cost me to get a steering wheel? So, if you wanted a steering wheel or a spare tire, it cost you extra. <laughs> <laughs> so, this, uh, the other thing that happened, uh, uh, just keep that this vision in your mind too, okay? Now, this is Mr. Longstaff. Leland. That's, and there he is, this particular. Now, I'm going to go back a little bit, because I want to tell you where now, how the interaction, the personal interaction takes place. The men came to work in the morning, dropped off, with a bag lunch, a couple of mystery meat sandwiches in there, and an apple maybe, and water. My mother, being the dear soul she is, God bless her heart, she would say, those boys cannot work on that kind of food. So she and many other women in Aroostook County would make up these great casseroles of macaroni and cheese and, and some gunion or whatever you call it, where you put all kinds of good stuff in there, and bake these great big casseroles. And then she would make five gallons of hot coffee with cream and sugar. And then the other thing that she did, and she did this all of my life and all of her life. She would make these little chocolate cupcakes and put white frosting on the top and a maraschino cherry. <laughs> oh. And so the men remember the porch. We would bring the men in and they would eat on the porch with us. We ate the same thing that they did. We ate with them. And that became the start of this bond that we had of these men. Because no longer are they the ones that I talked about in the very beginning where they were the enemy. Now they were the men who were helping us to get our potatoes out of the ground before it froze. And they were young. So one day it was time to take the food. We had two farms at that time. They joined each other. One was on the station road. And the other one was right there on the main room. He's shaking his head. He knows where that is. <laughs> and so we're down on the other farm. And I said, and Dad said, okay. And we take the truck and go get the food. And I said, okay. 
they did. So I get in the truck, 38 Studebaker, and I drove that thing home down the, the, the farm roads, went in the yard, and there sits the car. And I say to my mother, as innocent as she is, was, and I would say, hey, Mom, why don't I use the car? <laughs> she says, that's okay. <laughs> so we load up the car with the food, coffee and the cupcakes and the everything, food. And we put it in the trunk and the back. And here's what I did now again. I'm 13, 14 years old. So I roll down the, top, the window, driver's side. You put your arm out there like that. You over here, you turn on the radio and you get the best jazz you could find and you wind it up until it just blow your ears right off. And then I start the car. And I drive down to the field. I drive into the field, all the German prisoners are looking, staring. One we heard over his no wonder we lost the damn war. <laughs> <laughs> but my father was no use. <laughs> he says, don't you ever humiliate these men again, ever. He says, and by the way, you will not drive that car until you get your license at 16. Mm -hmm. That meant I had three more years of purgatory that I could not even touch that car. But that was the way my dad saw it. I want to flip quickly. Remember that picture, the first of us, me and dad, he's digging? Okay. The first day when those men came on our farm, my dad went to the closet, got out his hunting rifle, loaded it, and put it on the tractor. He said, I'm not going to have those guys threaten my family. The next day, gun went in the closet, never to be seen again. So there's a change immediately that took place between these men and my family. So here we are, I'm feeding those, we're feeding these men best we can. This one was an interesting story. The reason I put this one in is because we had 1938 uh, Nazi just like that and so forth. But here's the story. I want to tell you a personal story, okay? My sister is 10, all right? And everybody in Aroostook County, or not maybe everybody, most kids learn how to drive as soon as you can shift a tractor and put your foot on a car, put your foot on the brake and the clutch. You can do that. As soon as you can do that, you can drive around the farm. Okay, so Dad, he says, uh, Gail says to Dad, can I take the tractor and the digger back to the farm here? Because we had to take everything back every night, grease it, and service it. Dad says, sure, just be careful, always. Okay, so Gail starts out. Now, she's like every, not everybody, she wants to show off a little bit like I did with the car and so forth. So instead of going on the farm road, she went across the uh, field that had been dug. Now, potatoes are like this, you know, the rows of potatoes. So they're, they're still bumpy. So she's getting in third gear and she's tooling down the road with this thing. And the, the, and those of you who remember this, the, the throttle is right there. And that means you bring it down a ratchet and it doesn't stop when, like your foot does when you let off on the accelerator. So she's tooling down across the field. Bumpity, 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 bump. Pretty soon she's thrown off the seat. <laughs> and she falls between the shifting lever and the wheel. Now the, th the thing is going. One of the German prisoners sees this happen, and he runs, and he jumps between the moving tractor, the moving digger, and gets up there, grabs my sister, and shuts the engine off. No, okay, that's cool. That's made an incredible incredible impression on us. If I even look back on it now, I do get emotional about it. That man saved my sister's life, you know? This is my enemy. The guy that I was sworn to shoot. 
other things were happening in the world that we were totally unaware of, and I, I was totally unaware of. I knew, but it didn't affect me. But I always thought, what did it do to the German prisoners? This was the atomic bomb was drawn, dropped. We're picking potatoes on August 1945. So September, that war is over with an atomic bomb. The men are still there in Hope May. Some of them, in August, were picking potatoes on the Lund farm. Well, a couple of other stories before I go from there. Oh, as I said, the men came and lived on and, and eat, ate and sat with us on the farm. Uh, in our front room was our music room. That's where the piano and so forth was. One day my sister's in there practicing her piano and one of the German prisoners came and he said, and my mother, being the dear soul that she is, she said yes. And she went over, put her arm in his arm, and took him into the front room of our house. And he sat down and he played. Mm. Played beautifully, but something interesting, he never asked again. But when he came out of the room, and mom was there in the kitchen, he came over to my mother and did this, Mama, Mom. And, you know, one more time where humanity is celebrated. So, another time, my sister, by the way, my sister was blonde and blue eyed. So, Willie, remember Willie? <laughs> Willie comes in one day and he zips down his, or opens his blouse and pulls out a, a picture of his sister. His sister is the same age as my sister. Blonde, blue eyed. My sister sees it and disappears. Says, oh my gosh, what's been said? Why is she running away? And she skites up the stairs into her bedroom. And pretty soon she comes down again. And she's got this little package all wrapped up in tissue paper with a piece of red yarn around it, a bow on it. And she goes over to Willie and she hands it to Willie. And Willie, Willie opens the package up and inside was a little suit of doll clothes for his sister. Aww. Well, we stood there. He stood there, my sister stood there, and we all, those of us who were close enough by, we start to cry. I mean, tears are all over the place. So he stuffs it in his coat. Next day he comes home, comes back. He comes into the farm, comes in for dinner, and he zips, and he opens it up, and brings the package out, and he calls Gail, and he has to hand it back to her. Because he wasn't allowed to receive a gift from anyone. Oh. Again, our hearts broken. These little hearts, maybe big hearts. <clears throat> so this was this was part of that time of changing of how we felt about these men. This goes on. The next thing that happened is that the war is over. <clears throat> and the men are being taken home, back to you. My, my brother, Larry, who had been uh, training to be a spy, uh, they took those men in 45, and D-Day, they needed more men to fight in Europe. They took all those men who had been in college, and they gave them one week of training, infantry training, and then they shipped them over to Europe. My brother, because he wanted to be a lawyer, used that skill or of life and said, I don't want to do that. Can I join something else? So he joined the Merchant Marines, United States Merchant Marines. And this is the boat, this is the ship. I mean, to, to me, that's our boat. 
But here's the boat they were. This is a, a victory ship. And that ship was taking German prisoners back to Europe. So he had these, his experience. And so I see this as a circle that our family, somehow or another, was involved in this whole process, coming in and going back. So here he is, taking these men. I said, did you have any trouble? He says, those guys were the saddest people you ever saw in your life. They did not want to go back. And here's what happened to them when they get, did get back. If you were going to be held by the French, you would work in repatriation, rebuilding coal mines and you would be incarcerated for approximately two more years. If you went back to the Russian sector, remember what happened to Europe at this time? Right. Three seconds. If you went back to the Russian sector, you would wind up in a prison camp up to 10 years. Yes. Some of them never lived through it. Mm -hmm. So these men, so Larry had these guys, and it's never any problem. And I said, what about the guards? He said, there was no guard, there was no so where are you going to go? You're on the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. But here's the thing that was so sad and really shocked Larry, was the fact that when he got there, when the men got there, they were herded off the boat ship, and they were put on gondolas. They're like semis without any uh, trailers, without any top on them. And they were just tall enough so that if you stuck your head out, you could see what was going on. The French didn't particularly... Uh, Let's take, remember that the French had been absolutely ravaged by the Germans. So there was not a lot of love there, like as I'm feeling, you know, or like we were starting to feel. They had machine guns set up, so that if you stuck your head out, it was just the right height. He didn't see anybody get killed, but he saw that stuff happen. So this is where those men went back to. Now, some of the men who had been in the Polish area, there was no home for them to go back to. They were go it was gone. So that this is where those men, how they went back. When they went back, for two years, we received letters from these men. And they would write to us and, and, and ask us to do, uh, send them things or what have you. And uh, I have a whole bunch of letters that we got. It went for two years, and then it stopped. No more. So we weren't sure whether it was because of the government or because of their incarceration or whatever. But one of the letters in here goes like this. Uh, thank you. Many greetings, and so forth and so on. And then they usually said, in a few days I will be discharged. This is 1947. Send the great greetings to the great and so rich USA in the form of a package. They would ask for food or for clothing. They would say, my mother is destitute, we don't have any clothing, and so forth and so on. The other one that was, I thought, was kind of cool. Do you remember those black lozenges you used to get for sore throat? One of the, one of the prisoners wrote and said, please send black lozenges for sore throat. Now so that was a kind of interesting thing. So, what happened after this? The men, some of them came back, as I said before, became doctors and lawyers and so forth. I was doing the program in Thomaston, Maine, and there's a man sitting right in the front row, and I usually ask that any of you people have experience with POWs or uh, in your home or any, anything like that, and this guy raises his hand. And I said, what was your experience? He says, I was a POW. And I was stationed in that middle of the United States place, out in Iowa, I think. He says, and then he's sitting with his wife. He says, introduced me to his wife, American woman. And he says, uh, I am an American now. I said, well, tell me your story. He says, I went back to Germany. I finished my education. And while I was there, Americans were on the base and or wherever he was and I think he said I fell in love with her We got married because she's an American. I was able to come to America I and and he got here in 1951 
What happened in 1952? Because he is now in America. He is now within the draft age. He is drafted into the United States Army. He goes to Korea and fights for the United States of America. So it was a kind of an interesting doctors. Uh, two of them came back to uh, came to Holton, and they went there and they put up a, 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 a like a, a stone at, at the old air base. Mm -hmm. uh, then they left there. And only a, Holton gave them the keys to the city. You imagine this: your former enemy now getting a getting uh, welcomed in by the chamber of commerce. They left there and they came down the coast. And where I worked, I worked on North Haven and Vinyl Haven at the time as a counselor. And they came to North Haven and they were given the same kind of reception. And, you know, it was, it's, it's just such a wonderful transformation that takes place. As I told you at the very beginning, and as you saw, my, the title of mine is From Friend to Foe. From Foe from to Friend. And because I, I was a boy of 13, these experiences have stayed with me because I believe very strongly, even today, that I truly believe that if we were to be able to talk to someone, to talk to each other, and show our humanity and our care and our love for one another, I think we would maybe do some healing in this world. But human nature being as it is, maybe not, I don't know. But I'm still optimistic. I believe in it. I think the strongest, one of the strongest words in the world is love and acceptance and care for our fellow human being. Even your enemy. My grandmother used to say, love your enemy drives them nuts. <laughs> <laughs> I have a poem I like to close with. This is written by the British poet Thomas Hardy. And it sort of expresses how this, I think, whole thing works. It's titled, The Man I Killed. Had he and I but met by some old ancient inn, we should have sat down to wet our, wet our had a drink. Right? Many nipotin. But, ranged as infantry, and staring face to face, I shot at him and he at me, and killed him in his place. I shot him dead because, because he was my foe. Just so, my foe, of course he was. That's clear enough. Although, he thought he'd enlist offhand, just as I out of work and sold these traps. No other reason why. Yes, quaint and curious war is. You shoot a fellow down. You've met him, if you had met him in a bar, that is, you would help him to have a crown. Thank you. talked about the ones who are more politically oriented being being taken away, but what, what was the inner what uh, what did you oh ask talk them what about? they used to do, yeah. whether they were farmers or what they did for work. And they could either pantomime that or they could some there was a few people who had a few few men who had English. But most of the time we kept it away from anything that was political. Mostly it was like as I say Sometimes you ask them what church they went to, you know, and if they had a chance to go to church. Did they like music? Because our house was very musical, and so we talk about that, that type of thing. And the other thing, I guess we did, there were a couple of questions, like, uh, of course, the Hitler Youth thing was there, you know. Mm -hmm. And so we would ask them, were you drafted into the army? And, you know, some of them said, yeah, 14. 
because this is at the end of the war, and they needed people. So, so it was kind of a very open conversation. Yes, sir. Did you participate in any of the reunions that happened every five years? Oh, no, I never did. No. They used to come back. Yes. Yes. Oh, a wonderful story. Remember Dr. Gormley? Oh, sure. Okay. There was a man who got caught in the woods and got hurt, one of the German prisoners, and his arm was... And so the American doctors at the camp, basically, were going to take his arm. And so the American guys who were in the in the barracks and so forth and with them said, no, 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 don't do this. And they said, take him into Dr. Gormley. And Dr. Gormley fixed his arm and kept his arm. Any other quick one? Yes, ma'am. I don't have a question. I have a comment. My husband's family is from New Brunswick. Yes. And we have always in the family said, Barrera. Yes, Barrera. <laughs> it's a favorite word when I have Barreras. I used to have a t shirt that said the big Barrera. No one knew what was. Any other questions, folks? I want to thank you right from the bottom of my heart for the opportunity to be here today and to tell my story. And it is my story, and it has to do very personal about my life and my family and these men who happen to line, wind up in our front yard. And I used to say this, I think that Mom's secret weapon for peace was chocolate cup. Thank <laughs> you.